Thanks everyone for being here. Um, this is joint work with several friends and co-authors from Toulouse, Doshin, Yassin, Yaxin, Li. Um, and we started on this several years ago when I was visiting Toulouse and we, again, I'm sad to say it's still preliminary, but I hope that with kids vaccines over the horizon, I am soon in France finishing this up with them. So, um, to motivate this paper, let me start with an observation. I think you can find many definitions and lots of sort of public interest in the idea of product ecosystems. Many of the big platform sponsors have them, right? Whether it's Apple's um, collection of iStar devices knit together by their software or the Android ecosystem. Um, sometimes the definitions you find on the web are kind of built around user groups, the way we often think of platforms. Other times they're sort of built around devices. But I think it's fair to say that most of the multi-sided platform intuition that we bring to thinking about these ecosystems is based on models of platforms with two sides. Um, so here's a collection of sort of seminal papers um, from the early to mid 2000s that build out that intuition. A second observation, Sort of, sort of a, a related but slightly different starting point for this paper is that um, the literature on platforms has a great deal to say about the cases of monopoly and competition, but a little less about um, provide provision of complementary inputs to a multi-sided platform. Um, and so those two observations sort of beg a series of questions that you might think of as questions about complementary ecosystems. Um, things like how does the position of a device within a, an ecosystem, here you think of meeting a product network, how does it influence equilibrium prices and demand? Or what happens to prices and demand when complementary multi-sided platforms serve user groups that completely or, or partially overlap with one another? And those are going to be the starting points for our paper. Um, we're also going to motivate it with an application, and you know, in some sense, this is where we really began the process of writing the paper. We, you know, sort of we're thinking about overlapping um, complementary platforms, and we're thinking about it in the context of licensing, and specifically licensing as it applies to the the Internet of Things. So here's here's a way to build up the application that we're going to take with us all the way through the presentation today. Here's maybe a, a very stylized view of the the two G world. Um, there's a monopoly input provider. Think of it as Qualcomm. They own a bunch of patents that you need to use for CDMA. Um, they license two downstream goods. So they provide um, an input into handsets and into network infrastructure. And there are demand externalities between these two goods. The, the better the network, the more demand for devices that can use it, the more devices, the more the incentive to roll out a um, network that uses them. Um, so this is a really familiar kind of notion of a platform. Um, now imagine we take the, this hypothetical monopolist into the world of the internet of things. Okay, in the internet of things, there's still handsets and infrastructure, but these wavy lines represent both the limitations of my ability with uh, PowerPoint and the idea that there's, uh, network externalities amongst all of the downstream devices, right, which extend from cars to electric meters to appliances in your kitchen and whatnot. Okay, right. And so to the extent that they all use the same radio interface, um, the owner of patents that read on the radio interface can charge a price to the handset provider and another price to the infrastructure provider and another to the cars and the appliances and so forth. Um, and we might be interested in how those prices um, internalize all of the, um, the downstream network effects amongst devices, right? And then lastly, because we're, you know, so we're interested in complementary platforms, you might sort of complicate this model in a somewhat realistic way and say, well, what if there are multiple owners of essential patents, right? So not only do we have Qualcomm, but we also have, say, Ericsson licensing patents that are necessary to use the radio interface for all of these IoT devices. Okay, and so this is the setup. 
um, that we're going to study in this paper, right? A set of providers of essential inputs to perfectly competitive set of downstream industries whose products have um, network externalities amongst them. Um, I'll come back and talk about why this is or is not a, a great way to think about the real world of standard essential patent licensing, but for now, let's take the setup as kind of the motivation for the paper. So with that in mind, what do we do? Um, we, we build first sort of a, a model of pricing in that kind of a world. Um, and the trick behind the paper is we linearize demand to keep the whole thing tractable, okay? And then the first application of this is gonna be what I think of as ecosystem pricing, where we'll study the case where there's only one upstream uh, input provider who's a monopolist, and we show how prices and quantities are related to measures of network centrality, right? So this is a model of how do you set the prices for the ecosystem, the, your device ecosystem. Then we'll add, um, you know, sort of more platforms. Uh, and in that world, we can study how sort of basically the Cournot problem. Um, right, so we'll think about Cournot complements for multi-sided platforms. Uh, and in particular, we'll sort of show that at least for a, a single device within that network, you can kind of overturn the Cournot intuition. You can get prices falling as the number of complementary input providers increases. And then lastly, kind of at the edges of what we've gotten finished for this paper, we'll talk a bit about partially overlapping platforms. So a world where say you have two upstream providers that overlap on one part of the network, but have monopolies on other parts of the, the device network. Uh, and there we'll show how um, they have incentives to sort of over extract rents from the shared device. And that distorts us away from what we think of as the baseline prices in this model. So that's, that's where we're going. Um, so let me talk about the setup first, the model, and then we'll, we'll do the monopoly case, the competing, or, or actually not competing, the complementary platforms case, and then overlapping, and then conclude. So the setup, I think, I hope, is pretty simple. There's N devices um, or sides produced by perfectly competitive downstream industries with zero marginal cost. Upstream, we have the platforms or the licensors. In the general case, there's M. We'll start with K equals one. Each platform licensor holds essential patents for every device and charges P sub I super K to downstream sector I. So this is the device charged by platform K for inputs to produce device I, all right? Aggregate demand, the total demand for each device is given by um, this linear demand system. There's an intercept, device specific, less the sum of the input price charged by all of the platforms that are licensing inputs to that device, plus a set of demand externalities from device J to device I, okay? You can express this in matrix form, right? So if you write it this way, the vector of demands equals the device specific intercepts less the prices, right here, prices is an N device by M platform matrix, post multiplied by ones, plus the externalities. Okay, and so to make this thing stable um, so that there's no sort of profit pump kicking around in our demand system, um, we have to assume that the largest eigenvalue of this entire matrix of downstream externalities is less than one. And in that case, you can write the demand system this way, right? It's the bring this, the externalities over here, and then invert this matrix, pre-multiply by the linear demand system, and there you have it. Okay, and then there's one more thing to, to the setup before we get to actual results. Let me, I'm sort of gonna predefine the initial notion of centrality 
And this is something that we borrow from the literature on social networks. All right, so Katz Banasich centrality here, we'll denote it by C centrality for Katz Banasich, Banasich, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, is equivalent to the identity matrix less this thing, A plus A prime over two, inverted post multiplied by the intercepts. So what, what is this thing? One way to think of it is it's, it is a, a fixed point or an eigenvector of the average undirected externality matrix. So the average undirected externality matrix is just A plus A prime over two. It's the inbound externalities from devices J to I plus the outbound externalities from device I to all the J's divided by two. So you can think of it as, you know, sort of as though we don't care what direction the externalities are going in, you know, sort of we want the average strength of them uh, as between devices I and J, right? That's what this matrix gives us, okay? Um, that's a way, in, in the dimensionality of this thing is N by one. So every device has a katz banasich centrality. A different way of thinking about this that you can pull from the literature on networks is that if we take this average undirected externality matrix, call it B, then a device's cat's banasic centrality is its own demand intercept plus the value of all K step links to each device weighted by A. What that means is you can think of a, a step as one multiplication by the matrix B. Right, so we say the steps value is the value of the externalities inbound and outbound. Okay, and so you have a one, you can get to from one device to any other device by sort of a one step link or by taking two steps on the network or by taking three steps on the network or four out to infinity. Okay, so weighting those steps by the demand, the kind of baseline demand for each device, that gives you this geometric sequence, okay, and this geometric sequence will converge if the biggest eigenvector of B is less than one, and that's katz banasich centrality, okay? So this is something that shows up in the literature on social networks, the literature on pricing on networks. It's going to, we'll use it immediately, all right? And I think that's all we need for setup. Let me stop. Any clarifying questions about the setup? Okay then, first result, okay? In this world, what's the price is charged by an ecosystem monopolist, right? An ecosystem monopolist, the upstream, think about the, the slide with, you know, one licensor licensing many devices. It sets prices equal to this expression, um, one half A plus one quarter A minus, a prime post multiplied by the katz banasich centrality vector. And the equal de equilibrium demand at those prices is one half the katz banasich centrality vector. Okay, a bunch of remarks about this then. How do we think about it? What does it mean? There's three parts to each price. There's the baseline, okay, one half A. That's exactly what you would get in the simplest, you know, monopoly linear demand, no network effects kind of model. Okay, this vector of prices. Then there's two pieces that are really familiar going on in the deviations or distortions away from the baseline price. One is value extraction. Okay, so one quarter times this A matrix, which you can think of as an upward shift in the demand for each device because of the network effects from the other devices in the ecosystem feeding back into it, right? Post multiplied by centrality. And then there's an externality internalization. That's a mouthful. An internalization effect, which is minus one quarter A prime, right? So you subsidize devices if they produce a lot of outbound network externalities that increase demands for other goods in the downstream ecosystem. And again, post multiplied by the centrality measure. Okay, so that's basically the decomposition of prices. First result, I mean, this shows up in the, the various papers on two-sided platforms, 
or you know, kind of the next next comment rather than first result is that symmetry means we just get the baseline prices, right? So if the externality matrix of the ecosystem that characterizes the ecosystem is symmetric, equilibrium prices are the same as you'd get in a model of independent goods, linear demand, monopoly prices. Second, we go into some detail about this in the paper. There's a link between what we do and Armstrong's model in 2006, right? So Armstrong characterizes these distortions here in terms of these externality weights multiplied by demands, or in fact, utilities, if you go all the way back to kind of principles in his paper, you can see right away that our paper, if demand is the same thing as one half of centrality, okay, substitute this into here, this is the expression in our paper for the distortions away from the baseline price. Okay, so our model of ecosystem pricing is essentially Armstrong. We just express everything in terms of primitives here, as opposed to endogenous character, you know, features of the environment, like the demand for the other goods. Okay. I think I've already said this, um, but you know, there are, there are links that we build out in the paper to um, a literature on pricing on a network or um, social networks and games. Uh, and lastly, to sort of try and think about what in the real world this may give us some intuition for, um, I think it's interesting to think about what might be central devices in a, in a product ecosystem. Right, maybe it's phones or things. You know, I'm interested in Echo or Nest. These uh, things that Amazon and uh, Apple, Google may be selling us to sort of try and sit in the midst of all the other devices and connect them together. Um, okay, so let, let me now sort of provide three examples um, so we get a feel for how network structure relates to pricing. Um, all three examples are going to have the following kind of common features. The externalities are going to just take one of three, between any pair of devices, uh, we'll take one of three values, mu, eta, or zero. In general, think of mu bigger than eta. We'll set all of the device-specific intercepts to one, and we'll define this term d is equal to the, diff the positive difference between mu and eta. OK, so. First example will be a star, right? What does a star network look like? You know, so sort of graphically, you can think of it like this. There's one device in the middle that produces the big dark arrow externalities to N peripherals. Uh, and each of the N peripherals produces small externalities back onto the star device, I equals one. And then there's no relationship amongst the star, these to themselves, okay? In terms of a matrix, there's a column of mu's here. And there's a row of it. Uh, eta is here, and everything else is a block of zeros. So that's a star network. What are the prices you get from a star? Uh, so for the star good, you can see as long as D is bigger than zero, you subsidize it, and you subsidize it more the more peripherals you have. And for the peripherals, you can see we charge above the baseline monopoly price of one half. Um, and the extent of the markup, or, you know, kind of the rent extraction that you take on each of the peripherals depends on both D, which is the, this difference between the, our two parameters, mu and eta, and the katz banachet centrality of the star device. Tim, uh, yeah. Tim, before you move on, uh, David has a question. Uh, it's in the chat with maybe David can unmute and just ask about the central devices. Yeah, it, it so, would seem at least in the telecom application, the central device might be the, the network access, like you know, yeah. is any IoT. And in this example with the uh, subsidy, the hand, it might be a model that's sort of another model explaining why people give away the handsets to in that, in that interpretation. Because the handsets provide a lot of, uh, create a lot of app usage on the network. Yeah, I, that sounds good to me. Um, I, I'll be, you know, to be honest, I find it not a priori easy to know what this, the central device 
is, which is something we should think about a bit. But I, you know, I kind of I think that interpretation sounds plausible. Um, okay, let me let me return to a couple more examples just to sort of give intuition. Here's a here's a different structure. Okay, so in this structure, there's n devices and they exist in sort of a hierarchy, right? So device number one produces the most outbound externalities. Okay. Device number two produces the next most outbound. Device number, you know, all the way down to n, which produces the weakest outbound externalities and gets therefore the most inbound. In matrix form, it looks like this, right? So the first row, the outbound externalities from good one to goods two through n um, is a row of adas. And then the second row has a mu and then some adas. And the third row has a couple mu's and then some adas. Okay, I think I said it backwards. Um, but the math is right, okay? In this example, one thing to notice is that um, a, a plus A prime is symmetric. So the, the Katzmann acid centrality of every device is equal, right? Asymmetry in pricing comes only through the difference between A and A prime and not through centrality, okay? And what do you get out of it? So you can derive the expression for each goods, its price is one half minus D over four times this expression times centrality. And this expression is um, negative if n plus one is less than two. So we subsidize the devices that produce a lot of outbound externalities. And we exploit or raise the prices of those that produce few outbound externalities relative to inbound. Okay, And uh, every device gets a different price. And then a last example, this one, I, don't, I can't think of a real world network that would look like this, but I think it's useful for intuition. Imagine a ring. Imagine you know, sort of a set of devices that are that are linked in sort of a ring structure, where each one has one inbound um, externality of size eta, and one outbound externality of size mu. And then you see these guys in the corner here make it a circle. Okay, that brings us right back to sort of the baseline prices, right? So if the externalities are, you know, sort of if if there is a symmetry here, turns out this is a ring type of a symmetry as opposed to a reflective type of asymmetry, we often just get the baseline prices. Okay, so let me, you know, what do we take away in general from these examples? I think um, we see this familiar trade-off between external extraction of rents and internalization of externalities that are, that are there in two-sided pricing kind of models. But we see the structure of the ecosystem in terms of externalities between devices matters through centrality. Um, nevertheless, we still seem to sort of the general intuition that you want to subsidize devices that produce a lot of positive externalities onto other devices that that intuition still seems to hold. And then in general symmetry sense pushes us back towards these kind of baseline world. Okay. So that's complement, you know, so that's the baseline setup. That's a monopolist. Now let's think about complementary platforms, right? Remember this world, this was our motivating example, right? So now we're going to, we were in a world where there was just one upstream provider licensing or setting prices for N sides that were interrelated. Now let's add this second upstream per provider, okay? And I promised I would say a few things about actual, whether this actually applies to licensing. Um, I think there's a tradition of papers that um, take a Cournot complements type view of standard essential patent licensing. Um, there's good reasons for this. One is that, you know, sort of if these firms own patents that cover sort of um, a radio, which is sort of an IP that reads on many devices, um, and they have to be used and all of the devices are going to communicate with each other, then in some ex post sense, um, all of those patents are known to be that they are complementary, okay? But there's also some reasons to be kind of cautious about pushing this line of thinking too hard. In the real world, most of these um, standard essential patents are subject to commitments to license at fair and reasonable rates, which many people think is less than what could be charged by an unconstrained monopolist. Um, and they also say that the rates will be non-discriminatory, which means that there might be sort of constraints on your ability to set the price for one device differently than the price for another device. Um, 
And, you know, sort of even if we did think that there were, un, the patent provided like an unconstrained monopoly, I think there's legitimate questions about whether um, the price itself is something that's negotiated um, subject to threat of an injunction on downstream devices, which might get us towards this sort of unconstrained world versus reasonable rates that would be set by a judge. And then who knows where these prices come from. So all of this is to say, um, we're going to contribute to a literature that views licensing of essential patents as a core no compliments problem, but with being sort of cautious about taking our, our model too literally for a way that these kinds of prices are set in the real world. All right. So to get to what the model says, we need to adapt our definition of Katzbanasic centrality. Right, so it turns out that the, the network used to compute centrality when you have multiple upstream platforms is this. Is, you know, so instead of A plus A prime over two, right, we have this expression that puts more weight on the outbound externalities associated with each device. Okay. And here's how it factors into the symmetric equilibrium prices. Right, so define lambda here as one over m plus one. Right, in a symmetric equilibrium, every platform is going to charge this expression lambda times a, small a, plus a second lambda times this difference, which is exactly the same as in the monopoly expression, times centrality defined according to this different matrix, which puts more weight on outbound externalities than inbound externalities. Okay, a couple of remarks about this, right? So these baseline prices, lambda A, that's the, that's the solution to Cournot from 1838, okay? That's the baseline that you get without any of this downstream externality. It's just the Cournot complement. okay? Whoops. The weight, right? In this expression, you can think of these as weights, M over M plus one, and on this matrix, one over M plus one. The weight on outbound externalities here is in the centrality matrix is going to increase as you add more upstream monopolists, right? So the more severe the Cournot problem, the more weight we put on outbound externalities. I think the intuition for that is that the many monopolies problem leads to dissipation of inbound externalities, right? What does that mean? Inbound externalities, you can think of them as sort of in raising the intercept of the demand curve for any individual monopolist. Right, so the output of other goods in the ecosystem is translated into more demand for the focal good. Okay, but the more monopolists you put into the system, right, they're charging a rent themselves on each of the devices in the ecosystem, and that's a downward shift in the intercept of the demand system. Right, so the many margins problem um, is going to dis dissipate, you know, sort of the the inbound externalities on here. Right, these are the ones that cause you to raise your price, right? And so, our notion of centrality is going to put more and more weight on outbound externalities, as in uh, in the way we compute centrality. Okay, but but for that, you know, so you can see that this is exactly the same expression we had for the monopolist, but for two pieces, right? One is this Cournot term, and one is the different notion of centrality. All right, extending the, the comparison to Cournot a little further, right? we can say, look, the aggregate baseline prices, right? this is kind of the Cournot result, M times lambda times A, right? this is what we would have absent, these are the prices absent any downstream network externalities. This expression increases in M. Right, this is basically, this part is M over N plus one, which is increasing in M, okay? And then an interesting question is, for a particular device, right, somewhere in the downstream ecosystem, could you flip that result, right? Could you have some, you know, some device that gets cheaper uh, as we add more upstream monopolists? Turns out the answer is yes, okay? And to, to to show that, we use an example 
of what we call an augmented star network. Okay, so this is, it's a star network because we're gonna have one device that sits in the middle and generates outbound and inbound externalities as in the, the prior star example. But we're gonna augment it by, we're gonna sort of increase demand for the star relative to everything else, right? We're gonna set its intercept to beta bigger than one. Okay, so theorem three in the paper, core not, is that um, for the augmented star network, when beta exceeds this value, five thirds times root n minus one, the total price um, of a peripheral device is smaller when there are two upstream monopolists than when there is one. The intuition for this is the following, right? With this kind of augmented star network, what the monopolist does is subsidize the star and extract rents on all of the peripherals. We saw that earlier when we talked about the star network for a monopolist, right? They raise the price of all of the peripherals above one half and they drop the price on the um, star to sort of generate aggregate externalities, right? When we go to two um, upstream monopolies, you can think of both of those things moving towards the middle, okay, right? So it's gonna reduce its subsidy to the star device and it's gonna reduce its rent extraction on the peripherals. Um, and for these parameter values, that reduction in rent extraction will end up being larger than the increase in price associated with the basic multi-margins problem, right? The Cournot effect, okay? Um, and then again, to link this back to applications, I think it creates an interesting question. Think about internet of things, patent pools. Right now we're, um, we're starting to see patent pools forming up to license say cars and the next thing will be, you know, appliances or electric, you know, whatever, right? If you take the phones as already set, um, new pools are forming to license different kinds of peripherals I think it's an interesting question for policy whether we should think about you know sort of platform pricing incentives in uh, antitrust review of those pools. Tim, just a, a clarifying question. A couple of times you you mentioned when we have two monopolies. Uh, so so just uh, to clarify, when you say two monopolies, you mean like Cournot with two firms, right? I mean Cournot. I mean input. They okay. each have a, their monopolies in the input market, okay. not. Downstream throughout the, the ecosystem throughout this paper is provided by perfectly competitive zero marginal cost producers of each device. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because two monopolies is just something that doesn't often come up. In <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, it sounds like I'm using terms that are oxymoronic throughout. I hear you. Okay, last, um, this is sort of the last um, example kind of question that we deal with in the paper a bit. Um, thus far, symmetry, sort of both, you know, mainly symmetry on the network effects, but also sort of symmetry amongst the upstream monopolists has tended to push us towards baseline pricing, right? So the ba where baseline is what you would get in either independent monopoly pricing of each downstream device or in a world which is equivalent to Cournot, you know, so the simplest linear demand Cournot. What happens if we break the symmetry by allowing um, the upstream platforms to have partial overlap? That is, you know, sort of they each have an input that they monopolize and, you know, sort of two inputs are required for some of the devices, but only one input for others. Okay. Um, so consider a model where there's two upstream input monopolists and three downstream devices. Okay. Each of the upstream input monopolists uh, is a true monopolist downstream on one device, but they overlap on the other, right? I'm reaching for an example that I think is getting used in too many papers these days, but think about Apple and Epic. Um, they both charge for games, um, 
but they seem to have exclusivity in other things, right? So Epic has this graphics engine that Apple doesn't sell and it licenses it to developers. Apple makes a phone um, or App Store or whatever piece of the ecosystem you wanna say, you know, pick and, and uh, they don't overlap in those areas, right? So that sets up the following kind of a problem, right? So there's a star device, both firms charge for the star, right? Um, then each has its monopoly over one peripheral, okay? Um, I don't know if Andre is on here, but um, another motivating example for this is a, a HBS case he wrote about a company called Gree, which I teach and I find pretty interesting. I think gaming is a setting where you might find these kinds of partial overlap. Um, and so, Andre, do you want to comment? I see you unmuted. I mean, I can, I can only say yes, that is true. <laughs> um, so in this example, right, just to simplify things, let's, let's actually make this symmetric even. Let's, let's set mu equal to eta, okay? And what are the equilibrium prices? It turns out for the star device, the equilibrium prices are one third, which is the Cournot baseline price plus an additional markup, right? So that on, the, on device number one, the star, we charge something above the Cournot baseline. And then on these non-overlapping goods, right? We each charge what we would, you know, sort of the monopoly baseline um, for a, you know, um, a good without a Cournot problem. We charge a half, okay? So what's the intuition for this? What's going on? neither platform fully internalizes the externalities from subsidizing the star device, okay? We don't subsidize in some sense device number one sufficiently because when platform one lowers the price on the star device, it's producing some externalities for platform two and conversely when platform two subsidizes the star device, it's, it's producing some externalities for platform one that, that don't get internalized. Okay, so in some sense, platform, this is a, in this example, we see how partial overlap kind of exacerbates the double marginalization problem here, right? The aggregate price for the, the star device where we overlap um, is even larger uh, than it would be in a Cournot world without these network effects downstream. Okay, and with that, let me conclude. I think I got one minute left. What we try to do in this paper is build a tractable model of complementary ecosystems with multiple upstream input monopolists and multiple downstream devices that are interrelated to each other through network effects and ask about how prices relate to not only the magnitude, but sort of the structure of the downstream network externalities. And out of that comes this sort of prominence of cats Banach centrality. Uh, and then we use it to, to ask questions about how platform pricing interacts with double marginalization problems. Um, a lot of the trade-offs that you see in the baseline monopoly case are familiar um, from the existing literature on multi-sided platforms. I think that's good. But again, sort of I think our contribution is to create this link to centrality. Um, and I think when we get to a world with complementary platforms, um, we have some interesting things to say about how um, you can get sort of perverse examples if you're thinking, you know, sort of that the Cournot problem always predominates, right? And particularly, we show that you can get prices for one side in any case declining with the number of upstream monopoly suppliers of inputs, um, or you can we can show how partial overlap. Um, leads to partial internalization of externalities um, even when you know kind of the network effects are symmetric um, and so you can kind of get exacerbation of the Cournot problem as we saw in that last example and that's it I think I'm more or less on time and looking forward to the discussion thank you very much Steve this is this is excellently right on time uh so thanks for uh for measuring time so exactly uh now we'll have uh alex white uh discussing uh before we open it up for general discussion
Alex. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank are you, you very much. Are you, are you sharing slides or not? No slides. Okay. No slides. Um, thank you very much to the organizers and Tim. Um, when Tim and I first discussed this talk about a month ago, we, we had a little conversation about the paper he was talking about some issues of patent licensing and I asked him some questions and it turned out I was all wrong. Um, and then I looked at the paper and there's a lot of matrix algebra, which I'm not very good at. So it's the whole thing seemed at first kind of like, oh geez, what am I gonna do with this? Um, and so I'm really pleasantly surprised having spent some time with the paper because in my opinion, this is a beautiful, simple model that illuminates the theory of IO in quite a fundamental way. Um, and so, you know, I learned a lot, but I plan to continue studying this paper and hope to, you know, expect to learn to learn more. Um, just to put it in context, um, you know, you start off with basic oligopoly theory, Cournot, the Cournot substitutes versus Cournot complements. And, you know, if, if you do a good job, you study these two models and understand the the driving forces behind each one that leads uh, when you go from monopoly in the direction of substitutes, it leads prices to go down. And when you go in the monopoly from the, from monopoly in the direction of complements, it leads prices to go up. And as Tim alluded to, we've been spending years, you know, decades, a couple of decades, extending the sort of oligopoly model to the case where there are network effects and um, summarizing sort of what we know about um all uh, network effect competition with substitutes when you increase the number of firms um on the one hand that causes market power of firms to go down so that pushes prices down but on the other hand there's a tendency under monopoly to to provide users with a discount to discount prices in order to internalize externalities and as you um add more substitute competitors, the incentive to provide this externality discount goes down. It kind of gets, the discount gets divided, roughly speaking, by the number of um, competitors. Um, and so in, in particular, there's a recent paper by Tan and Joe in the restud that um, illustrates this point very, very cleanly. And one of the things that the Tan and Joe paper, sort of their main result is the possibility of what they call the perverse pattern where if you take the price of equilibrium prices in, a, um, in an oligopoly model with network effects and you increase the number of competing firms, you might get prices to go up because the um, reduction in the externality discount resulting from additional competition may outweigh the reduction in market power that comes from um, additional competition. And so what you know, what you can see this model is doing is looking at the same question, but going in the direction of complements. Um, at a very high level, they're saying when you go from having a monopoly, and Tim is using the word, I think uh, it would be clearer to use the word like components, producers of multiple components or something like that, rather than saying two monopolists, three monopolists. When you go from having centralized control with a single monopoly, platform to decentralized control of the components in terms of pricing. Um, of course, we get the one effect of double marginalization pushing prices up, but we also get a stronger effect for prices to go down due to the externalities. So as you increase the competitors, the strength with which price uh, externalities drive the prices down goes up. And so it really has this very nice, um, almost symmetric relationship to the world of substitutes. And that's sort of a good way to think about it at a high level um, and to sort of convey how fundamental this is. But at the same time, it's a lot more, it's a lot subtler and more interesting than just that. I think it, Tim mentioned that the key for them to be able to move forward from a technical perspective is to linearize the demand. Um, and by doing that, 
they can, even in the monopoly case, so usually when you have a, a setup like this under monopoly, taking, uh, maximizing with respect to prices doesn't really get you anywhere. It's not tractable, but under this linear setup, it becomes tractable and they get this very nice decomposition of the network effects into um, outbound and inbound externalities. So that in and of itself seems to me as kind of as a bit of a contribution. It's not really a new solution to a problem, but it's a different it's a different view on a solution to the monopoly problem where there's this decomposition between outbound and inbound effects, which people have been aware of, but it's really the linearization of the problem that makes um, that, that that kind of gets you over the over the hump and, and seeing what's going on. Um, and um, the key insight you get there, um, well, okay, so so then you go you go from that basic setup and monopoly to the complements world, and then you you see that the um, the due to this decomposition, when you decentralize control from monopoly to multiple complement producers, the force of the, the, the relative force of outbound externalities increases compared to the force of inbound externalities. So the importance of outbound externalities grows with the number of producers, but the importance of inbound externalities stays the same. So you get this nice um, increase in the, um, in the weight of the externalities that's proportional to the number of producers, which is exactly the mirror image of what we see in the substitutes in the substitutes world, where, where you also get something that's proportional to the number of producers, but the effect is getting smaller and smaller. So I'm very excited to try to understand these different forces better. Um, they have nice examples um, comparing the star network where you tend to you know, assume positive externalities, the hub, you, you have this hub and spokes, you can think of it that way, right? So the, in the star network, the hub tends to get um, discounted and the spokes are the, the cash cows or they're the, they're the, the ones that, that the sellers try to exploit. Um, and that, that all makes sense. That's kind of a reality check. Whereas in the ring structure, what they find is that the prices don't change compared to the no externalities case. A um, couple of questions, minor questions there. Um, is, is that result about the prices not changing um, purely due to linearity? That would be interesting. I, I suspect if you had a nonlinear world, you'd still get the prices the same, the symmetric across the different um, devices, but that they wouldn't necessarily stay at, at the one half level. So these are types of things that would be interesting as robustness checks if possible, but I understand that you have to be linearizing in order to make it tractable. Um, but I, I think the sort of final bigger point I would make is, can you go for a bit of a deeper result in terms of the um, comparative statics on prices as you increase the number of complement producers? Because you're going for this thing where you, where you look for the possibility of a price drop for one of the devices. Um, and, you know, a nice thing to notice about this is that we actually do have variable usage here, right? So in the Tan and Joe substitutes model, in order to make the, uh, the model tractable, they have to assume full market coverage. So they can look at prices going up and down, but no matter what happens to prices, it's always, you know, a measure, the same exact set of consumers who are consuming the goods. But here in this complement setting, you get for free the fact that as prices change for each device, the usage goes up and down. So could you come up with a relevant measure of aggregate usage and um, you know, convince, come up with a convincing um, explanation or convincing justification for why this particular measure of ag aggregate usage is the right one or a relevant one, and then look for conditions under which um, as you add um, go, go from monopoly towards more complement producers, the aggregate usage goes up as a result of this strengthened externality effect. Something like that would really, I think, make this paper extremely strong and, and very important. You know, it would help help um, help build the, the contribution of this paper. So 
I've probably Hannah, Hannah, I've probably used up my time. So well, uh, twi twice, but uh, uh, but I'm I, sorry. Yeah, if, you're, if you're if you're wrapping up, you know, I think it was worth it. it yes. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I really enjoyed it.